the button. The button shows up. I'd like to welcome each of you here to this afternoon's seminar. We are deeply privileged to have uh, Dr. Cohn, a professor uh, at the University of Michigan, who's in the Department of Biologic and Material Science and also uh, in the uh, Department of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, Dr. Cohn received his training, his undergraduate training at the Tulane University and also uh, his doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania. His uh, Current work at the University of Michigan focuses on biomineralization and tissue engineering. Uh, he works to design materials that have better biological integration so that the materials and the biological materials can work well together. And that's an important uh, role to play, important aspect uh, in medical science as uh, as typical in uh, one of the things you might do is, although he may not be doing this, is with uh, various knee replacements and so on, integration, but it probably is more sophisticated than that. But we'd like to welcome Dr. Cohn. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to come out here today and you know, participate in your anniversary uh, celebration. Um, speaking of knee replacements, you guys are probably 30 or 40 minutes from the world capital of joint replacement in Warsaw, Indiana. Uh, Warsaw, Indiana. It started there after the Civil War, making all kind of appendages for people who were injured in the war. And 150 years later, the hub of joint replacements worldwide with the most employees, the largest companies, is right in your backyard. So, wow. uh, okay. so I um, want to talk to you today about our work in biomaterials, uh, the subtext being how do we get materials to better interact with their surrounding biological environment? So. Uh, talk a little bit about the history of materials, a rationale for looking towards nature as a means of uh, inspiring the design of materials. And on one hand, it's very easy to generally say, let's mimic nature. Nature has hundreds of millions of years of evolution. She's a far better bioengineer than man could ever be. But the academic question is, well, what do we mimic? Uh, and I'll spend the majority of the talk uh, giving examples, primarily from my lab, of things we've done to enable materials to better talk or communicate with cells. So a broad overview of my lab is, is really two aspects. One is looking at materials from biology, a top-down approach, trying to understand what nature provided us. Much of this work uh, has to do with bone, looking at structure, property, relationships, adaptation, and then using this information to feed into the second aspect of our lab, using this information to design materials, biomimetic or so-called bio-inspired materials, with a particular focus on materials for use in medicine and dentistry. Okay. So can't come from U of M without giving you a <laughs> picture of the most important building on campus. The University of Michigan likes to say we have 1.3 billion, with a B, in dollars in research expenditures. And the athletic director says, that's nice. We're the gateway to the university. <laughs> so I don't give them much money, so my seats are somewhere up in the north end zone. Is there a point? Whoops. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, okay, so my seats are up there, a little to the right of that yellow section. Um, but I introduced this slide because perhaps the second most iconic structure on campus is what they call the rock. Uh, 
And if you head into the university from the east, this rock sits at the gateway and it's been painted tens of thousands of times for over a hundred years by student groups, by groups wanting to make some type of social statement. And it's a fairly iconic figure. And this is a great way to introduce the concept of biomimetics or biomineralization. Because even though I'm talking about biomineralization, talking about mineral, what I really mean is mineral plus protein. A mineral without protein is kind of a boring rock. So if I say mineralization, please, as chemists, understand that I really mean both inorganic and organic constituents. Okay. Okay. So I got interested in the topic of biomimetics. I won't ask any of the faculty if they were around in 1981, but I venture none, none of the students were. So I was a sophomore at Tulane University, and we had a supplementary textbook called Structures or Why Things Don't Fall Down. And for once in my life, I actually read supplementary material. And it was really interesting of, in a very qualitative, non-engineering fashion, talking about why birds can fly, talking about how structures are designed to, with minimal mass to still achieve a design objective. So 1981, Ronald Reagan was president, Princess Di got married, MS-DOS was the operating system, yeah. and <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, the movie came out. So the structures, uh, the concept of biomimetics stuck with me, Raiders of the Lost Ark is still out. None of the other things on this slide from 1981 are still with us, but certain things have longevity. But I use this slide to A, give you a little history, and B, for you students to say, you know, there are things that can inspire you as an undergraduate, and 35 years later, they're still part of the core of what you're doing because it's really, uh, really motivating towards you. So you never know when you're going to be in a class, you're going to read something, and it's going to inspire a career trajectory. Okay. So a couple of slides on the history of materials. And can anyone think of what my message is? I want to be interactive with the students rather than just me lecture for an hour. Can anyone think of the, what the message is from this slide? I'm sorry? sorry. Close. Uh, it's nylon. The message is the nylon that the troops used when they invaded Normandy in 1944 is fundamentally a similar material that was used for vascular grafts in the 40s and you know, almost through today. So the message is whether it's the acrylics that your grandmother had for dentures and are largely used today, if anyone in the room has dentures, uh, those are materials developed in the plastics and paint industry. The nylon uh, was developed for parachutes and found its way into medical prostheses. 1950s, the war, war was over, the troops came back, there was a baby boom, there was a housing shortage, people moved out to the suburbs, needed drapes. Dacron was used for drapes and found its way into medicine. 1960s, plexiglass was introduced into orthopedic surgery. The 70s and 80s, advanced metals, fiber reinforced composites, used in joint replacement. The message of much of the history of biomaterials that goes back to several thousand years BC has been taking materials or stealing materials from other industries for use in medicine and dentistry. And there's been a long history of success, but there weren't, it wasn't the ground root, grassroots, ground up design of materials specifically for this medical specific medical applications. Okay. So much of what we do in my lab is we take a material, the polyester on the left, and have it interact with cells on the right 
body has no receptors for synthetic plastics, so it really doesn't know what to do. So what the end result of that can be what's circled in red is bone loss around a dental implant because the bone is biologic, it's dynamic, it can adapt. The metal is a piece of metal, it can't. So there's really not a lot of communication between the material world and the biological world. Or to make an analogy, you have the material and the biology in the same physical space, but they're not talking. It's kind of like a dysfunctional couple. They're in the same physical space, but they're not communicating with one another. So in fact, what we want to do in my lab is help materials communicate with the biological world or play marriage counselor so the materials in the biology can communicate with one another. Okay. So why do we need to regenerate tissue? I said in my first couple of sentences that you're less than an hour away from the world capital of joint replacement. Those are lucrative companies. Those are great jobs. I know students from Michigan have gone there and stayed there for 20 years. But there's still inherently things that inherently could be better when we use a man-made material. There's also some times in which the body breaks down and there's just a need to regenerate tissue. So another question, what do you think? This is an actual CT from a patient of a colleague of mine. Uh, what do you think might have happened to this patient? Right. Gunshot wound. Yeah. Well, my next hint was it's a male, so yeah. gunshot wound trauma. Okay. Could be cancer. Could be some congenital disease. Uh, as many times, defects don't heal for a variety of reasons: genetic diseases, tumors, trauma, and typically, healing is also compromised if there's compromised blood flow. There's underlying systemic disease or the tra traumatized area is just too big. So this is a motivation for regenerating tissue, creating some type of catalyst for the biological system to self-heal when the insults are too large for it to self-heal on its own. Okay. So a basic premise of tissue engineering is can we provide the cells with some type of appropriate cues to grow and form functional tissue? And the engineering part of tissue engineering is engineering the environment to push the cells to what they're intrinsically capable of doing. Okay. So that sounds great. The field of tissue engineering is about formally about 25 years old. And what we really want to do is here's a schematic of how a cell communicates with its surrounding environment. And this is uh, probably medium in complexity in terms of uh, a laundry list of schematics I could have showed you. So the question is, we have this complex system of how cells communicate with their surroundings that's taken millions and millions of years of evolution to optimize to some extent. And we want to try to reproduce that. The obvious question for, for the biologists in the audience is what? Are you kidding me? Do you really think you can mimic nature? The answer is no. We want to selectively mimic. So these are my children when they were very young. They're not so young anymore. But if I were to go around the room and say, describe some attributes of a baby, what would people say? Cute. Cry. Anything else? I'm sorry? Dependent. OK, so we can easily make things that are wet. We can make things that are cute. We can make things that are dependent or need to be supported. None of those would really make a baby. So what the same way that it's very difficult to reproduce those cellular interactions I showed you on the previous slide. So what we really want to do is what I call selective 
mimicry. Take a small subset of traits to try to achieve a specific design objective. And the key in tissue engineering is use this small subset of traits, use this design objective to push the biology so that it can ultimately regenerate on its own when it couldn't without such a catalyst. Okay. So what are some of the things we could mimic? Well, we can mimic something macroscopically, like shown on the top left, that's a temporomandibular joint, or the joint right here in the jaw. That's taken from an actual CT scan of an animal, and we're mimicking the macroscopic shape. We can go down a level in scale and mimic the internal architecture. We can mimic not the architecture, but optimize the architecture to maximize a certain mechanical property like the strength. We can mimic not structure, but composition. We can mimic structure architecture, but not on a macro scale, on a micro scale. Or we can mimic some of the molecular attributes. So these are just a smattering of examples of things that we could selectively be mimicked that have all been tried in various aspects of biomaterials. Okay. So in my lab, we look towards nature, look towards what do cells do? How do cells communicate and signal with one another? And there's a, several fundamental things that they do. Cells uh, interface and are tethered with surrounding extracellular matrix, and that provides an anchoring and mechanical signals. Cells also receive soluble signals from the environment, and cells can also, shown here, their uh, cells are docked together. Cells can also interact and have not communication with the soluble environment and not communication with the solid extracellular matrix, but communication with one another. So cells can communicate uh, with a variety of aspects of their environment. So in my lab, a lot of what I want to present today is work on biomineralization, self-assembling of nanoscale bone-like mineral to simulate the interaction between a cell and its extracellular matrix. Second thing is create organic, inorganic hybrids to simulate this tethering between the cell and the matrix. Third area that I won't talk about today in the interest of time is drug delivery to simulate the soluble signals that helps a cell communicate. And third area, fourth area on this slide, the third area I'll talk about is how do we engineer cell communication between one cell and another. So looking towards how cells interact and signal with their environment are things that we've developed into our materials uh, synthesis. So why do we want to mineralize materials? Um, what's shown here is a sheath of fibrous tissue. Just about any implant that's put in the body is not really recognized or recognized as foreign, and it tends to be walled off. The same thing, if you, if you have a splinter in your finger and it doesn't migrate out, it could stay there forever. It's surrounded by a sheath of fibrous tissue. Same thing with that titanium knee replacement. So many of those millions of hip and knee replacements developed in Warsaw, they function well, very well, They're in patients for 15, 20 years. But there's this fibrous sheath that's immediately adjacent. The bone doesn't grow right up to the implant. So if that fibrous sheath is below a certain threshold, of about 200 microns, the implant could be fine. If it's much thicker than that, then there's going to be a compromise in the ability of that implant to transmit force to the surrounding tissue, and the implant could become loose. So even in well-functioning implants, there's this fibrous acellular capsule. That's true for just about all biomaterials, except for a few bioceramics. 
in which there's not this fibrous sheath, but a continuous chemical gradient between the surface of the ceramic and the surface of the bone. So probably going back to the early 80s, it's been recognized that you can achieve a direct interface, a direct bond between a tissue and a material when a layer of bone-like mineral gets formed in the body on the surface. This doesn't happen with metals. It happens with a couple of classes of, of glasses and calcium phosphate ceramics. Okay. So we want to mimic that bone-like mineral on the bench top to see if it can better direct cells towards forming bone. So biomineralization is one of the older, oldest evolutionary processes. This coccolith from the sea shown in the upper left has probably been around for 70 million years. Uh, shown on the upper right is a schematic of the collagen in bone in orange, and the mineral in green grows into select spots into the collagen called whole zone. The message is whether it's the seashell, whether it's bone, whether it's the enamel in your teeth, the core principle of mineralization is that a protein template serves to guide and orient the nucleation and growth of the mineral. So can we do that on the bench top? If there's an ability to functionalize the material and just about any material can be functionalized, shown schematically. We can graft functional groups on uh, even very inert polymers or metals, and then expose it to an appropriate ionic environment. We can chelate mineral. We can attach uh, self-assembled monolayers. That would chelate calcium. Or if you had a very uh, hydrolytic uh, polymer, just simple hydrolysis would create enough functional groups to uh, chelate calcium ions and form mineral. So there's a number of fairly simple strategies that we can use to recapitulate one of the core principles of biomineralization that goes back some 70 million years. So this is all driven by the thermodynamics that you've learned in chemistry, and we can take a porous material on the order of 10 millimeters thick that has internal pores on the order of hundreds of microns, feed it through a bioreactor in which there's a salt solution, and by having an understanding of the ionic strength, the pH, and the temperature, we can predict where on this domain we would get heterogeneous nucleation or nucleation of mineral seeds onto the surface of the polymer. And shown on the bottom left is a CT image of a mineralized uh, polymer. So we're able to self-assemble mineral onto the surface of a soft material and then use that mineral or variants of that mineral to see if we can better manipulate or control the biology. So depending on what was on the x and y axis of that previous graph in terms of ionic strength and pH, we can control uh, the chemical species of the mineral, we can control the crystallinity, we can control a number of stoichiometric and compositional metrics. And the bio part of that materials or materials chemistry is that depending on the specific nature of the mineral, the biological response differs. So you can take the 10,000 uh, foot view of this data that the input to the system, the materials chemistry, leads to the output of materials, the differences in materials characterization, and those differences in materials characterization as input to a biological system lead to differences in output. Okay. Okay. So now, we take these mineralized materials and seed stem cells on them and transplant these constructs with cells and materials into an animal. What you're looking at is amount of bone formed on the y-axis. The x-axis are different means of getting the cells into the material. And I'll come back to that 
in a couple of slides. The message from this slide is the material that has mineral was able to support more bone formation. So a little bit of efficacy to this uh, biomimetic strategy. Now, same data I showed you has just been flipped around, so now we can view it as not as a function of material, but more as a function of how the cells were seeded or infiltrated into the material. Uh, a static seeding is just pipette the cells in, the filtration is run them through a reactor with a pressure gradient, micromass is having a more dense mass of cells. Depending on how we get the cells in dictates the amount of bone that's actually formed, number one. Number two, also dictates the spatial distribution. So this led to the question, the initial conditions, about three hours worth of seeding, significantly affect what happens inside the body after about two months. That's one important outcome, but it led to the question, are the, is the ability of the cells to talk to one another altered in these different configurations of the way we put the cells into the material? So the answer to that is yes, or I wouldn't have included this in the talk, is what you're looking at here is dye transfer. Just in, inject a dye into a population of cells, culture these culture a second population without the dye, and over time look at how much of that second population uptakes the dye as a means of how cells talk to one another. So this micromass seeding, where the cells are densely packed, as you might expect, has more communication. And that led to the question, can we engineer communication? So that schematic I showed you at the beginning, uh, one of the ways cells communicate is via gap junctions on the cell membrane. And when gap junctions from one cell interact with the gap junction on another cell, there's a docking and these channels come together and then there's ability for ions, that red circle is the limit of my artistic ability, the limit uh, ability of the ions or other molecules below a certain molecular weight threshold to be transported through the junctions from one cell to another. Okay. The most prevalent gap junction in bone is uh, one of the connexins. So we wanted to engineer the cells to have better gap junction communication, better cell-cell communication. So we did this by overexpressing the connexin, and the important data from this busy slide is we overexpress this gap junction protein in yellow, leads to a higher amount of communication between cells. What's shown on the top right is, don't have my, don't have a pointer. So what you're looking at on the left is BMSCs, those are control cells. What's shown in red are cells at the periphery of a material, and what's shown in yellow are cells at, in the interior. So if we do nothing, the cells, transport limitations mean that the cells differentiate more, express more markers that are indicative of their being directed towards bone, much more at the surface. When we overexpress the gap junctions, looking at the second set of histograms, we not only increase the magnitude of how much of these bone markers they express, but we eliminate that gradient. We're able to equilibrate what's happening in the interior to what's happening in the exterior, and that's a means of generating more robust and larger volumes of tissue. And then in an animal, this is a defect in a rodent skull, and we want to introduce a material with cells to try to heal that defect. And you could see that as we manipulate the gap junctions, we're able to better fill that defect. Okay, so the message is the cell, cell communication from an observation 
of why do we have this result based on different ways we infiltrate the cells into the material led to a concept of can we engineer this up through a small animal model. So we've taken this biomimetic principle and developed it to <coughs> the point of a proof of principle in a small animal. Okay. Uh, interest of time, I'll skip these next two. So the next thing I want to talk about is we've worked with solid surface in introducing a mineralized surface. We've worked with soluble signals or cell-cell communication. Next thing we wanted to do is can we do anything to improve the tethering between a material and cells? And this is not necessarily a new concept. There's a large number of cell binding sequences, large number of matrix binding sequences that are known from nature, and people have even put these together to create tethers between the material world and the biological world. Problem is, very few of these sequences are specific. In other words, that RGD sequence that's fairly ubiquitous to cells is expressed on a whole host of cells, not necessarily just the type of cells one might want to use in a regeneration process. So nat nature's cell bonding molecules, at least the ones used in tissue engineering to date, lack specificity and therefore there's a large variance in outcome. So we set out to try to discover peptides that have more specificity and three aspects to this project. One is creating more specific tethers between the material world and the biological world. Second is targeting, using the peptides to target uh, polymers loaded with drugs to specific sites. And the third is using these to inhibit pathological mineralization. I'll talk mostly about tethering cells to materials and then a little bit, if there's time, on inhibiting pathological calcification. So I'm going to do a disservice to one of the best PhD students I ever had and collapse about two years' worth of work into a slide and a half. She used a phage display, which is a combinatorial approach to screen large libraries of sequences to try to identify peptide sequences or amino acid sequences that had specificity to specific material chemistries. So starting with a commercially available library, she, this is two years worth of work on this slide, she identified three out of 10 to the ninth sequences that were candidates for true strong binding to bone-like mineral and B, specificity. Okay. And we settled on this VTK sequence and have been using that for about 10 years. So first, here's a demonstration that A, there's binding and B, there's specificity. So there's no binding on this non-appetite control shown on the left. This E, A, S, and V, A, S, and V are three of the uh, amino acid sequences at the phage display yielded the E as a positive control. Those string of E's make it very highly negatively charged and therefore very amenable to binding to bone. Okay. And she actually did this again. Uh, this is close to another two years' worth of work, but it was done in parallel, so it wasn't two plus two. It was probably closer to uh, two and change. Did this again with stem cells and tried to, ident tried to identify sequences that had specificity toward specific population of stem cells known to form bone. 
And then she put these together and created dual functioning peptides. The two on the left are just the mineral binding peptide that I first spoke about. The four on the right are different dual functioning peptides and this DPIVTK are the cell binding sequence she discovered linked with the mineral binding sequence and shown on the y-axis is tau 50 is the shear force it takes to detach 50 percent of the cells from the material. And the dual functioning peptides, as you can see, had take, requires the highest amount of shear force to detach the cells. So they enable much better adhesion. So not only that, but there is specificity. What you're looking at on the top set of histograms is the percent of cells adherent uh, to the substrate normalized per amount of peptide. So this dual functioning peptide has great adhesion to the bone marrow stromal cells that the phage was run against and negligible adhesion to other types of cells. The VTK, the mineral peptide by itself, doesn't adhere cells. You wouldn't expect it to. Uh, on the bottom, different types of cells, again, the MSCs, which the phage was run against, yield the highest amount of shear. So this shows that by preferentially designing this tether between a material chemistry and a, a specific type of cells, yields stronger adhesion than if we just take a more nonspecific uh, type of chemistry or not more nonspecific tether. And that's more specific to specific cells of interest. Okay. And then again, an in vivo proof of principle, you're looking on the y-axis, amount of bone formed, looking on the x-axis of different types of uh, peptides or materials without cells and peptides, and if we tether these dual functioning peptides, VPI, VTK, can form more bone. And this P15 is a positive control. So again, from concept based on biomimetics through cell culture work, through animal work, the evolution of showing proof of principle. Okay. Now, One of the limitations of this discovery by phage is there's no post-translational modifications. There's no such as phosphorylation. So we went ahead and phosphorylated these peptides, adding a lot of negative charge, and as you can see in blue, the adsorption increases by anywhere from twofold to tenfold. Okay. Not really surprising, you're adding negatively charged sequences. And then on the right, if we scramble that phosphorylated sequence, we don't have a large reduction in adsorption. And that said that the charge trumps the sequence, and it also said that we waste two years' worth of work. All we needed to do was make it more negatively charged. And in the context of synthetic materials, the answer is, yeah, we might have wasted time, but uh, we get into actually binding to bone, I'll show you that it wasn't a waste of time. Okay. So, a detour. Research is full of detours. And we, about five years ago, we weren't expecting this, but it's led to a different branch in the lab for uh, the past five years. And that is, we took this phosphorylated peptide, put it in culture, with uh, osteoblasts or cells that form bone. And what you're looking at on the top is the amount of calcium deposition, one metric for forming bone. What you're looking at in the middle is a stain of the actual mineral that forms. And you can see for the phosphorylated peptide shown in white on the top histogram and shown in the lower set of wells 
on panel B, we get above a certain threshold concentration, the mineralization stops. Okay. And the mineralization doesn't stop because we're doing anything uh, cytotoxic. Uh, that's shown on uh, panel C where the cell metabolism and cell viability aren't changed. So the peptide is inhibiting the mineral not because of any uh, toxicity or poisoning, it's through some other mechanism. And this led to question, can we now use these not in a en tissue engineering or tissue regeneration uh, framework, but in a framework of inhibiting undesirable mineral? Okay. So now, here again is the unscrambled in white and the scrambled in gray. Whereas the scrambling had no effect because the char with the synthetic materials, because the charge trumped the sequence, with biological mineral was more of a balance. So we could breathe a sigh of relief and say, no, we didn't waste two years. The sequence is quite important here. Okay. So from a therapeutic standpoint, what this data is showing is once the mineral once the mineralization starts, we can still introduce the peptide and slow it down. And since most pathological mineralization, whether it's a kidney stone or calcification of your blood vessels, one's not going to seek therapy prophylactically. They're going to seek therapy when the mineralization starts. It's important to know that we can cease or at least have the mineralization plateau once it starts, we don't need to prophylactically administer this. Okay, so once the mineralization starts, whether looking at amount of calcium in the system or just aerial coverage of the mineral in the wells, we can uh, stop the mineralization once it starts. So that led to can we utilize this as a system to prevent pathological mineralization. And being in the dental school, one of the diseases that clinicians treat is what's called craniosynostosis. When a baby's born, these lines are what's called sutures in the skull. Those sutures don't fuse because the skull needs to be able to expand to allow for the brain to expand. Craniosynostosis is a, is a disease in which there's premature fusion of these sutures. And here you can see schematically there's not a singular phenotype of this disease. There could be different combinations, one or combinations of these sutures that prematurely fuse and leads to a variety of deformities in shape, deformities in function, depending on the severity and the time of that fusion. So we have an animal model in which the BMP, or bone morphogenetic protein receptor, is altered, and that leads to a form of this disease in an animal. If you compare panel B to A, you can see a shorter length of the skull, a shorter snout, and premature fusion of one of the sutures. Okay. So we work we've done in the past few months is can we deliver this peptide to the animal and try to rescue this malformation? So the metrics showing here are more morphological, the length of the skull, the width, and this is really only on a couple of mice, mice, an underpowered experiment, but it's suggestive that in certain areas we're able to rescue the growth, have a more normal growth uh, of the skull, and if there's more normal growth, then some of the restrictions on uh, the pressure that's put on the brain and the inability for the brain to develop uh, can be alleviated potentially. So 
I will end where I started and give a variation of what I started the talk with, and that is uh, instead of a mineral without protein is just a rock, a material that doesn't have the ability to communicate with its biological environment is just a rock. It can serve a very important purpose, but it fundamentally just sits there. So if you're not interested in biomaterials, you can view this as uh, a rock just sits there or the dysfunctional couple just sits there without communicating. So that's the main message I wanted to convey today by smattering in some examples from my lab and elsewhere of things that can be done to make a material more dynamic, more communicative with its biological audience. So uh, if a lot of the specifics you weren't familiar with, that's fine. Take the 10,000 foot take home message of it's a lot of work with man-made materials to A, get them to communicate better with the biological world, and B, design biomaterials from the ground up as opposed to being corporate raiders and stealing from other industries. So that's really the take home message. I have a lot of great collaborators both at Michigan and elsewhere. Uh, Udo Becker in geology, we did the molecular modeling of the peptides with. Um, Mohammed El Said in biomedical engineering, I didn't really discuss the work on using the peptides to tether his polymers that deliver anti-cancer drugs. Um, Paul Krebsbach, a longtime collaborator in cell biology. Uh, Yuji Machina, work with on the craniosynostosis animal model uh, and a variety of support means and uh, collaborators around the world. Uh, we have a lot of fun in my lab. None of us are going to quit our day jobs, but uh, we do try to do things outside of the lab. So I really you know, wish you a happy uh, anniversary year. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, come here and talk and visit. And you know, just give me a yell if you have questions about biomaterials, career interests, graduate school interests. And again, if you were into the specifics, great. If not, then take the 10,000 foot view of there's a lot of work done on using chemistry, using a lot of chemistry amongst other disciplines to get materials to talk to the, having the synthetic world talk to the biological world. So you know, appreciate your time and uh, the opportunity to speak to you today. Okay, so we want to thank the speaker, but we do have a lot of eager co uh, students here that would want to ask questions. So I'll take this side, and Dr. Novak will take that side. Remember to say your name before you ask your question. OK. You're not going to hear it. OK, I'm Naudi. I would like to know what was the involvement of the dental school in your research? I'm sorry, the involvement of the dental school? Mm -hmm, in the research. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so dentistry at Michigan and in many places around the universities around the country and the world, including the NIH or the National Institutes of Health, have long been the hub of biomaterials, because probably the materials that have been used the longest, going back probably 2500 BC, were materials that were put in the mouth, materials for artificial teeth. In parallel with that, Many places, including Michigan, have a hub of bone biology, not housed in a medical school, though there's great people there, but housed in a dental school. So now you marry biomaterials and bone biology, you have a critical mass of people that are interested in developing materials, developing strategies to regenerate bone. So I would say just about everything I presented is applicable to dentistry. Very little of it is exclusive. 
Uh, everything we talk about regenerating bone could be done in the jaw, could be done in the hip, could be done in the spine. Uh, the one thing that is probably most uh, specific would be the craniosynostosis model. So uh, Michigan is actually one of the few dental schools that values fundamental research and never ask the question, how will this impact dentistry? It could, but it could impact other uh, disciplines as well. But a larger issue would be, uh, and we see this um, in many departments, including the chemistry department at Michigan, there's not so many silos like in the old days. You have people in the dental school doing things that I could be doing this in orthopedic surgery, I could be doing it in biomedical engineering, I could be doing it in materials engineering. Likewise, my colleagues in chemistry have a home in chemistry, but they could be doing that work in a chemical biology department. They could be doing that work in a macromolecular materials department. So intellectual boundaries are really being broken down, and I think the best way for me to ask, answer the question how this interfaces with dentistry is everything is related, but nothing is specific. Hi. Um, <clears throat> sorry, yes. Um, I was wondering, I know that your work was on um, bone, specifically uh, communication with the bone, mm -hmm. but do you think you can implement some of this into other transplants, like heart transplants or um, liver transplants, some of what you're saying? Yes, so uh, a great question. Um, the cell-cell communication most certainly could. That's a fundamental biological process. We would need different proteins. The connection we used is not specific, but it's most prevalent in bone. But we could reproduce that with other proteins that were more specific to cardiovascular physiology, for example. Okay. The peptides, I view them as the specific peptides we worked with were designed to tether a inorganic mineral, mineralized biomaterial to a specific type of cell known to form bone. The approach, the two years worth of work that I glossed over and did a gross disservice to the student who did the work, that approach could certainly be reproduced for any application in which you wanted to improve adhesion. So whether it was a material that you wanted to interface with a cardiovascular system to promote growth of a blood vessel or to inhibit calcification, whether it was adhesion of two synthetic materials, dissimilar synthetic materials to one another. The process when Sharon finished her work in my lab and did her postdoc, she applied the technology to defining markers for colon cancer. So the process beyond the specific peptides we work with is most certainly amenable to not only a lot of biological applications, but just a lot of applications in uh, man-made materials if you wanted to adhere uh, two different uh, synthetic materials together. Hi, my name is Emery. Um, so, kind of to go back, you were talking about um, dual functioning peptides mm -hmm. being the most, you know, successful as far as adherence goes. Um, contrasting those with what you previously discussed was the mineral binding. Just for clarification's sake, would you utilize mineral binding, you know, in certain instances and then you know, the, and then the dual functioning in others, or was it just kind of general overall dual functioning is more successful? So the, the yeah, sorry if I didn't make myself clear. So the mineral binding was done first to have a peptide that anchors to the mineral. But the second half of the equation is interfacing with the cell. So the mineral binding peptide by itself doesn't have inherent ability to interface with the cell, so that's why we make the dual functioning peptide of tethering the mineral binding peptide to the mineral material and then tethering 
the cell binding peptide to the mineral binding peptide, and then the cell binding peptide uh, adheres to the cell. The mineral binding peptides by themselves, because they bind to mineral, do have the ability to inhibit the pathological mineralization. So not in a regeneration genre, but in an inhibition genre, then the mineral binding peptides by themselves bind to both man-made mineral and biological mineral. So if they bind to that mineral that's prematurely forming in the sutures of the skull or mineral that you don't want, that's forming that you don't want in the blood vessels, then the mineral binding peptides by themselves can truncate that approach. So there's a use of both the single as well as the dual functioning uh, peptides in different applications. Hi, my name is Helen, and I also had a question about the dual functioning peptides. Mm -hmm. And so you talked about how they increase um, stem cell adhesion and specificity. I was just wondering um, what it is about these specific peptides that makes them favorable for this purpose. Okay, that's a great question. That is someone's PhD dissertation in the lab. So <laughs> what I showed you so far was the first proof of proofs of principle that A, these dual functioning peptides do what we thought they would do in terms of binding and B, do what we thought they would do in terms of specificity. And then we also showed that human, hu cells from the human bone marrow cells from the mouse bone marrow, uh, these peptides tend to work equally well with. So uh, not sure what receptor, what integrin is actually being, the peptide is on the cell is actually being interfaced with. It's a great question, but the evolution of the work is, okay, system works, now let's backtrack and ask the more mechanistic question that you're asking. So a very important and very good question. Hello, my name is Seth, and I have a question regarding, um, do you have any research opportunities during the summer for students or anything like that? Uh, yeah, not just me. I would, uh, depending on what department you're interested in, you can go a couple of ways. You can email department, or you could do a little legwork and find specific faculty in areas of interest and uh, cold contact them. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of the intellectual boundaries, at least at Michigan, are broken down. So you could find biomaterials, you could find materials chemistry, whatever your interest might be, in five, six, eight different departments. So if you just sent something to the chemistry department, you may only capture 25% of the activity in a particular field. So the answer for both me personally and uh, U of M more generally is, yeah, there's a lot of uh, summer opportunities. Um, and I've had people in my lab, uh, not only uh, from Michigan, but from you know, any number of other uh, universities. So uh, most labs could give you uh, a little bit of a stipend for the summer, but there's no centralized means of finding you a place to live. So that would have to be on your own unless you have good friends there. Uh, but yeah, definitely, uh, if you're interested for next summer, um, do a little legwork. Just look at the websites at U of M and uh, Googling you know, what specific areas of research you might want to get into, and you'll find more than enough uh, labs doing things in just about any area. Sometimes when you study an area for a long time to try to make something happen, you get some insight into how to stop it from happening. Mm -hmm. um, have you thought about biofilm formation on synthetic polymers and synthetic materials and how to prevent it? Uh, I mean, classical techniques involve cytotoxicity and so forth, but maybe you've gained some additional insights via maybe other mechanisms. I don't know if communication plays a role in that and so on, but do yeah, you have any thoughts on that? Definitely, um, and biofilms are huge in dentistry. Um, 
is a lot of work, not in my lab personally, but I have colleagues uh, in Michigan and elsewhere that work with antimicrobial polymers. And they can inhibit or delay the formation of biofilms. So it wouldn't be outrageous to interface those antimicrobial materials. Uh, a lot of them are uh, methacrylate based, somehow interfacing those with uh, the materials we have. Um, the key question in tissue engineering is you're pushing, pushing, pushing to turn it on. But what happens if you can't turn it off? Well, you can't turn off growth, that's cancer. And a couple of responses would be um, you're relying on the cells to intrinsically being turned on and turned off as they normally would. Second response is more cynical in that the field, me, me personally and the field as a whole, hasn't matured enough to grow huge, huge volumes of tissue. We're still working on turning it on and making sure it's turned on. Uh, we haven't gotten to the point of having the problem of having it turned on too much. So I, if that is a more general answer, then getting back to your specific question, the the most prominent thing that comes to my mind about the biofilms would be uh, work with these antimicrobial polymers. Now, phage display has also been used to identify uh, peptides for microbiological purposes that either you know, promote or inhibit uh, certain pathways. And the military is using them to detect toxins in the air. The military is using them for a lot of uh, purposes, you know, germ warfare, essentially. So the phage could be used with any, you know, any substrate. Substrate could be a, a solid substrate. It could be a gas. It could be a liquid. So I think there's longer term potential to go through a discovery process on identifying markers that would inhibit biofilm formation. Uh, in the shorter term, work with known uh, materials such as antimicrobial polymers and peptides would probably be a quicker translation. So I think, yeah, there are things uh, going on, although we, we haven't interfaced uh, with that aspect of the field. Hi. Um, for babies born with cranial malformations, mm -hmm. um, do you know if anything is currently being done to help them with development? It typically undergo a lot of surgeries. So essentially putting a spacer in the skull to prevent it from fusing. Now, one of the problems is you know, doing, doing skull surgery is difficult enough. When you do it on someone that's growing, then almost by definition, you're going to be doing multiple surgeries as the growth occurs uh, over time. So the solution, are there solutions? Yes, uh, they're about fairly crude and not all that different from what was done 50 years ago. Uh, so uh, not that one always needs an elegant solution, but that's really what's done. And unless it's a very severe case where the baby was born with a gross deformity, there's a lot more subtle uh, aspects of the disease that you don't capture until you notice some functional compromise. Uh, but the short answer to your question, I think most of the work is to do some surgery to separate the sutures physically with some type of spacer to prevent them uh, from fusing, and it typically requires you know, going back in you know, some time down the road. Okay, thank you very much. Very good lecture, and um, we look forward to hearing more of your progress of your work. Uh, hey, thank you. Future. Thanks again for in accepting our invitation. Absolutely. Thank you.
signed up for the Vespers, please do so. And uh, tell your friends and family to come March.